Dear colleagues, we are back uh, at the module on bladder cancer. We are going to discuss a clinical case on muscle invasive bladder cancer. And now we are listening to Maria Ribal. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Morgan. We will go through a clinical case just to discuss the key points of muscle invasive bladder cancer. I would like to present to you a 63 years old man with diabetes, a surgery in England, inguinal hernia, hypertension, and medical therapy. He, following a maturia vesicle tumor is diagnosed by ultrasound and confirmed by cystoscopy that says that we have a four centimeter vesicle tumor and uh, it was admitted to TURV and multiple biopsies. At this moment, we realize we have an invasive urothelial carcinoma with solid pattern, high grade, and lymphovascular infiltration. And at this moment, I would like to ask you if uh, you ask your pathology for anything else in the report. For example, you ask for uh, molecular classifi classification or PDL1 status, always, only if you have an invasive disease, only when you foresee new adjuvant therapy, or never. Fred, what do you do in your current practice? Well, I wouldn't do that standard, but if we have a trial, which we currently don't have for muscle invasive bladder cancer and neoadjuvant therapy, I obviously would go for a marker. What I would have liked to uh, know from my uh, pathologist is the biopsies. You've taken biopsies, whether it's carcinoma in situ. In the Netherlands, multimodality treatment is very uh, popular, so that means that you would leave in the bladder. Uh, you would treat with chemoradiation, which you will not do in case of uh, carcinoma situ. So that's something I would like to know, but not standard currently uh, markers for people. It is true that there is a molecular consensus around this classification now. And uh, Johan, in your daily practice, you work with uh, urologists. Do you request that? No, no, because there is. Uh, it's not a standard because uh, the uh, uh, the treatment is not. Uh, uh, done according to the molecular classification so far. So even for PDL1, there is, a, of course, there is some uh, trial. So we can we can ask for the PDL1 status, but in standard of care, never actually. Okay, thank you, Maria. So the truth is that uh, evidence is already aligned with uh, the opinion of my colleagues, and in a recently consensus between EAU and ESMO, molecular markers is true that are not ready for prime time. And even in the EAU guidelines uh, for muscle invasive disease, we recommend that uh, don't use routinely molecular markers to base our treatment decisions. So we will continue with the case. Do you remember we have a muscle invasive disease? And now it's the time for staging our disease, and I would like to know from you uh, which uh, workup you do, urography, just a CT scan, bone scan, or you use, for example, PET scan on your staging. I think it would be interesting to have the perspective and the point of view of Fred, because he's the leader of the guidelines panel on muscle invasive bladder cancer. So do you follow your own recommendation, Fred? Yeah, the recommendation in the guidelines still is to do a CT scan of the chest and of the abdomen. Uh, I do see, uh, you know, not only in my country, but also internationally, that PET CT is gaining uh, popularity. Um, I could imagine that uh, within a few years we make more PET CTs. We have to gain some knowledge about that. I would personally still do only a CT scan of the abdomen and the thorax. I'm only concerned by the quality of the predictive value of the PET CT in, uh, in uh, urinary bladder cancer. And uh, so far, uh, it's not recommended. Are you aware of, uh, I would say, uh, new data coming that could, uh, I would say, convince us to change our mind around this? Yes, there's been a very nice recent uh, meta-analysis of the value in screening for PET-CT, for MRI, and for CT scan. And I have to admit that actually CT scan came out as the worst one. So, again, I think that within a few years, with some more evidence, we're going to switch to PET-CT. Johan, your perspective? We, we, we follow the guideline, of course, so far. Um, but uh, PET scan could, could have some room when we are discussing one lymph node, uh, uh, univocal uh, lymph node, you know, uh, just around the bladder. So it, case by case, we can, we can have a PET scan for, for one patient. Okay, Maria. Our guideline says that PET scan is not ready for prime time yet, but it's true that it will come. And we will see also the role of MRI in bladder cancer, because probably it will be incorporated for testing new adjuvant or whatever. So we will continue with the case. What we did is what the guidelines recommend. So we went to a CT scan from the thorax and the abdomen, and we realized that we have a muscle invasive disease, a T3 N0 disease. And at this moment, I would like to, to know your opinion about if you use new adjuvant therapy in these patients. And I would like to know if you do it always, only in selected cases, or if you decide to include these patients in trials with immunotherapy, or you never 
use new adjuvant therapy. So what do you do when you discuss this case uh, at your tumor board, uh, Fred? Well, if you look at the picture, it's clearly a large invasive tumor. Marie already indicated it's clinical T3. So for me, this is certainly an indication for neoadjuvant systemic treatment. Uh, basically, that would be chemotherapy. Unless, of course, you've got a trial with immunotherapy, then I think everybody gets wiser when we put patients into trials. I would put the patient in the trial, but certainly I would give him neoadjuvant systemic treatment, which I would not do in a smaller T2 tumor. So in that case, I wouldn't follow my own guideline, but in this case, you see the picture. It's a large tumor. I would certainly give systemic therapy. The same thing for you? Yeah, you as a patient is uh, eligible for cisplatin based chemotherapy, of course, the standard of care state that we should offer the patient neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but we, we, we're trying to improve the outcome of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So if we have a trial, we will discuss uh, to enroll the patient in a clinical trial. Okay, Maria. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy in our EAU guidelines is already recommended with a level one uh, of evidence and a strong recommendation to be offered to all patients with muscle invasive disease based on, on survival. And also, probably in a few years, we will see how immunotherapy comes in this setting uh, because we have already uh, data saying that uh, PT0 disease can be obtained in almost 40% of the patients using pembrolizumab. So we will see in the future if we change the standard. We will continue with our case. We have a muscle invasive disease, and now we should decide about a cystectomy. And I would like to know from my colleagues uh, which kind of cystectomy do you do, if open lap or robot, and which kind of urinary diversion you use in this patient that is a younger one, uh, quite fit, with a T3 disease. Fred, what do you do in your center? Well, I do still open uh, cystectomy. Uh, basically, I don't think there is a large difference between open and radical cystectomy. It's more a question of choice and taste. Uh, as long as you choose for, and that's also in the guideline, if you choose for an experienced surgeon, an experienced center, I should say. So the way you do that, I don't think it's very important. Laparoscopy is a little bit out of uh, fashion currently. And in this younger guy, 63, I think I would discuss at least uh, a neobladder with him. But obviously, it's something that he would decide in a consultation with uh, my specialized nurse. I think it's an important point that was made by Fred. The choice of the approach is not uh, changing from a patient to another. It's a choice of the team. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, we decided to switch to the robotic approach like two years ago. So every patient who is suitable for surgery is undergoing a robotic radical uh, cystectomy. But the whole team chose to move to uh, uh, robotic surgery because I believe that when there is discrepancy between the surgeon in the same team, it's not, uh, I would say, uh, something that is coherent. So I would definitely propose a robotic uh, cystectomy with a lymphadenectomy. And uh, what I would like to emphasize is that we do uh, the urinary diversion intracorporeally, uh, which is, uh, I think, a major step forward if you go into the uh, robotic direction. And for sure, uh, we would have to discuss with the patient, I meaning a young patient, I would propose a neobladder. I think, Morgan, if you do an extracorporeal reconstruction, then the advantage of the robot is very limited. Huh? Yeah. So what do the guidelines say? So the guidelines say, okay, uh, we have not enough data to recommend one technique over another. So uh, the truth is that uh, uh, we cannot say that uh, robotic is better than open unless on minimum points like bleeding, for example, or stay, but we will see how it uh, evolves in the future. So uh, it's true that uh, probably the main question is that still is a um, challenging surgery. So uh, recently we have done a systematic review in our EAU guidelines and uh, the point is that probably this surgery should be submitted or should be done in uh, experienced centers. And a uh, high volume center and after this systematic review has uh, been defined as minimum 10 uh, cystectomies per year and ideally more than 20. So what we did at that moment, the, we did an open radical cystectomy, although in our department now we are changing and we are doing both open and robotic. We did a lymphadenectomy for sure. And we offer, since it was a young man, a neovlada always. And we did neoadjuvant chemotherapy at that moment with those ends and back. Maria, can I ask you just a point? How much time do you spend between the end of the chemotherapy and the start of the surgery usually? When do you schedule your patient? Uh, six years ago, we started with a specific circuit. So now from TORB 
until cystectomy, there's no more than three months because we have a special alert for muscle invasive disease. Pathologists tell us in a few days, we present a case in a MDT, uh, we start chemotherapy or we include the patient in a trial. And in less than three months, we are, uh, from the diagnosis, we are doing the surgery. Okay, and be, uh, Fred, between the end of the chemo and the, the, the cystectomy? Depends a bit on, of course, how young the patient is, how fit he is, but preferably as soon as possible. So we try to do that within around four weeks after stop of chemotherapy. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. And finally, uh, we did our surgery and we found after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, that we still have a PT3 disease in the bladder. It was an N0, but it was a muscle invasive disease with invasion of the perivesical fat. So at this point that uh, we still have muscle invasive disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, I would like to know which is your opinion. You will include this patient in a clinical trial for neoadjuvant therapy. You will uh, consider as non-responder and go directly for immunotherapy you will expect till progression, or you will check out the patient, look for performance status after surgery, renal function or wherever, before to take your decision. Maria, can we ask you first if there was any sign of histological variant in that report? Not in this patient, was not. And other point uh, was, was the, the margin status of the patient? It was negative. Okay. Fred, your opinion? Well, standard of care is, of course, currently not to give adjuvant therapy, but to wait until the signs of progression are seen or recurrence are seen. Uh, although I guess uh, probably in the very near future, these are the ideal patients to treat with adjuvant immunotherapy. There have been some trials. We are waiting for the results this year, next year. And I'm quite sure that in a subset of patients, adjuvant immunotherapy will be the standard within a few years. But currently, no standard adjuvant treatment. Johan, what would you say to the patient? I, I do agree we, uh, again. And the patient is not non responding to the best chemotherapy regimen we have, Tostanzen back, so it's, it's useless to use uh, key, um, gems R and many other uh, chemotherapy regimens. So we have to put this patient in a clinical trial, actually. So we have three currently, uh, Ambigo, Ambassador, and the Checkmate, so we, we, we will wait for the data now. But in the standard of care, we have to follow the patient very closely, and it is he's likely to, uh, to, to progress. Oh, yeah. So what do the guidelines said again? And the guidelines said that the role of adjuvant therapy based in chemotherapy combination should be reserved for those patients that has not received any new adjuvant chemotherapy and they have a PT3, PT4 disease or uh, and, uh, positive disease after cystectomy. So uh, at this moment, uh, patients could be offered immunotherapy only under clinical trial setting. I would like to thank you very much for this uh, interesting case discussion.